I want to look at specifically the idea of creation and to consider creation as part of the expression of God's glory. And so, as I mentioned last week, I kind of have a theory, and that theory is that if we really knew our Heavenly Father and His majesty, in His power, in His glory, that we would have absolutely no inhibitions about serving Him uh, in a faith-filled, God-centered, all-out for Jesus' life. And so what I'm expecting and what I'm hoping to gain from this series is that you gain a new appreciation for who our Heavenly Father is and that that gives you a deeper dedication in your life and walk with Him. And so last week we had a chance to uh, take a look at God's glory as it was expressed in light. As we recognize that light was a uh, metaphor for his goodness, that is that he is pure goodness, there's no darkness in him at all, there's no sin in him at all. And so what is there to fear? I mean, if we were to go in, uh, all in to serving God, what is there really that we're holding back? What is it that we fear? Well, if he's pure goodness, then there really should be nothing that we should be fearing whatsoever. And then, of course, it was also expressed in his infinitude. That is, his infinite power, his infinite wisdom, and his infinite presence. And so, this week, I want to continue along that theme. Please keep those things in the back of your mind as we kind of look now at uh, God's creation, and more specifically, about God's creation of who we are as, a, uh, as humankind. So, let's start with a quick word of prayer. Gracious Father, I just give you all the praise, as uh, the song said. We do adore you, Father. We want to serve you all the more. And yet, Lord, we are living in a fallen world, and we are people from broken backgrounds. And so, gracious Father, uh, as you extend your mercy and your grace to us, help us now to have open hearts, receptive hearts, to hear the word of God, to let it be able to work in our hearts, and that we might receive that message that you have for us, that it is your glory that you are willing to share with us and help us to recognize what that means in our lives. Father God, I pray that the Spirit of God might move in our hearts, that we might serve you all the more as a result of these things. And Father, once again, just hide me behind the cross. There's nothing that I have that's of any value unless you bless it in Christ's name. Amen. So when we're talking about uh, the, uh, God's creation, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And by the way, this is another one of those fire hose presentations, okay? So if you don't write fast enough, don't worry about it. Just talk to me afterwards. I'd be very happy to send you the notes on this, okay? So there's lots of uh, uh, scripture references. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, And God said, Let us... Let's stop right there. Let us make man in our image. Okay, there's a plurality here. The plurality is talking about the Trinity. So you're talking about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all together in creation. And it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And this is a pretty exciting thing because when you begin to understand the image of God, it means in his totality. So when we're talking about God creating us in his image as a reflection of who he is, in every aspect, in multiple dimensions, not just in the fact that we have two eyes, two ears, a nose, and a mouth. And so in the next passage in Genesis 2 verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. This word breath or to breathe in the Hebrew, it can also be translated spirit. So he breathed or he, or he put his spirit of life into the man. And this is not the same kind of life as in the animals. This is a kind of connection with God that none of the other creation had. And so here we have God breathing life into man in order to have fellowship with him. And he became a living being. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. You see, if you've been called by God to be one of his children, if he, if he has put his spirit in you because by faith you've received the gift of God through Jesus Christ, this means that he has created you for his glory, to share his glory. Think about that, to share the very glory of God. He has made you to share in that glory. He has formed you. His confirmation is that you're important. John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. But as many as received him, meaning Jesus Christ, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. 
to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, it's God's will that those who receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior become children of his. This is why he created humankind. Not merely as another creature, but to be able to have fellowship, to be able to share his glory with, to be able to be one of the, his children and to be called his children. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, now anytime Jesus says something like that, you know it's emphatic. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, how is it that we can become the child of God? Jesus is saying here, you must be born a second time. And the guy that he was talking to was a Pharisee. He was one that was uh, a teacher of Israel, and he didn't understand this. He says, well, how in the world can I crawl back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? It's physically impossible. And he's saying it's not the physical born, being born again. We're talking about the spiritual rebirth. What was lost by the first Adam was that connection with God. But what was gained by the second Adam, who is called Jesus Christ, that was the giving, that life-giving, eternal life-giving spirit that we, he reconnects with us. In fact, the Spirit of God at one point is called our down payment for our internal inheritance. Our down payment. Just like you were to buy a house, you put some earnest money down guaranteeing that you're going to follow through with that purchase. Jesus put down his down payment in us through the Spirit of God saying, in the day I'm going to redeem your body and you're going to be with me and I'm going to share my glory with you when you see me in my glory. This is an amazing thing to me. You must be born again though. This is not just mental assent. Like, I believe in Jesus just the same way I believe in the tooth fairy and other things. No, we don't believe in those things the same way. He's saying trust, a deep abiding trust. How I live my life is based on how I walk with Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 44 through 45. It is sown a natural body. Now he's talking about the physical body. There are some questions that had come up in the Corinthian church. And Paul is explaining the difference between the physical body and the body that we're going to have in heaven. He says it is sown a natural body. It has raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. He makes a distinction. They are different. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, referring to Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit. And so if we are to walk with Christ, then it is more than just the fact that we believe in him like we would believe in some other mythology. It's an acceptance that he's not only real, but he wants us to walk with him, to have a relationship with him, to day by day have a spirit of kindredness. That life-giving spirit, the spirit of God who indwells all believers. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Catch that. Who has blessed us with how much? Oh, 10%. Uh, I'll share my inheritance. You can have 25%. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him, look at this, before the foundation of the world. Before the world was formed, he knew who was going to be his children and who was not. Now there's a real problem with predetermination with some people. Because they see God as being arbitrary, as if he's some kind of a, uh, has a selection process and there's a conveyor belt of people going by through all of time. And he says, well, I'll pick this one, I'm going to throw this one away. That's not what it's talking about. We'll get to predetermination in just a second. But what I want you to understand is this. God's foreknowledge recognizes and has made promises to anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. He promises them that he has chosen them. That they will be predetermined to have a life with him with certain benefits. Namely, joint heirship with Jesus Christ. Everything that is Jesus Christ will be shared equally amongst God's children. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So before he even began to form the world itself, he already had a concept. He already had a thought. He had already had you in mind. And he said, I will call those people. 
Ephesians chapter 1 verses 5 and 6, having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now remember, without the Spirit of God, we are God's enemies. Because without the Spirit of God living inside us, we have no connection with holiness. We have no connection with righteousness. We are a broken person. We are separated from God with our sins. And yet, the instant that we repent, the instant that we ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins, that we believe in Him as the Savior, that we recognize that His finished work on the cross has already paid that penalty and for the wrath of God, that we no longer owe that penalty. We can trust Him to take us to heaven. He seals us with that Spirit of God. That's the earnest, the down payment. And with that comes a promise, a predetermination, a predestination saying that we are to be adopted as the sons of, uh, of His sons by Jesus Christ. We become His family, not merely another creation. We're not like the animals. We're not like the plants. We're not like the angels. We become His children by adoption. And this is by His good pleasure, by His will. To the praise of the glory of His grace. That grace is His unmerited favor. In other words, if we, if we don't fully understand this, because we're Americans, we don't get kings, we don't get monarchies, we don't understand that. But in order to enter into the presence of a monarchy, in order to stand in the presence of a king, they have to accept you there. You have to be there by invitation. And if you're not there by invitation, you just walk up to the king, you can be killed. And so the king would, by tradition, lower their scepter as a sign of, and, and a significance of saying, I accept you into my presence. And so here we have the king of kings and the Lord of lords where we can go to him any time. And he lowers his scepter and says, I accept you into my presence. That is grace. God's unmerited favor. He accepts us into his presence by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So I don't want you to get hung up on predetermination. A lot of people think that there's a real uh, difference between predetermination and free will, like they're two opposites. So it's predetermination versus free will. So I have a little analogy here. I hope it helps you understand it. Predetermination is kind of like a prepaid calling card. You pay for the calling card and then you have the promise with that calling card that anybody that you call, that you're not gonna be charged for that call or at least it's prepaid, all right? And you can connect with that person. Now, it is absolutely crazy to me that somebody would say, I have a prepaid phone card, I have the promise of calling somebody, and they put it to their ear and they say, hi, Bill, how are you? Well, that's not what it's saying. You don't use a prepaid calling card that way. It's the promise of calling somebody. But you have to physically call that person to get a hold of them. That's the free will part. So even though I hold a promise in my hand with a card, I still have to make the phone call. God's pre-will or predetermination is similar. If we can understand God's predetermination is a promise to those who will call upon him. From Romans chapter 10 verse 13 it says for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's a predetermination in that. If you call, you can have the prepaid card, but you got to make the call. If you call, there's a promise. And that is that you will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from the wrath of God. Saved from the turmoil that awaits those who are not saved. But that's a promise. It's a predetermination. These are what I call the whosoever wills. And so you could be that whoever will. You could be in that group. But that doesn't mean that you've appropriated the benefits of that promise yet. And so free will has to kick in. Romans 10 verse 9, a few verses earlier. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So here we, ha here we have the whoever did. And I know it's bad grammar, but understand that whoever did appropriated the promise that was predetermined. And so we can have predetermination and free will. They go hand in hand. 
Faith and works are the same way. Eternal salvation is not by faith only. Faith is believing in the finished work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Works is a lifestyle of trusting Christ to direct your life while you are walking with him. So it's not just a matter of having faith. It's a matter of having faith and showing it in the works of your lifestyle. In other words, you cannot live a sinful life and be honest in your walk with Christ. You can't do it. Because you can say, I believe in Jesus Christ. But if you never take action, if you never allow your life to reflect that, remember, God, as we understood his glory in the last session, was, uh, was illustrated in light. In other words, there's purity there. That purity means that he's going to purify us in our walk. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives in us. That is His predetermination. That we are not only part of the Beloved, but we are to be transformed in our walk to become like Jesus Christ. And so it's not faith versus works. It's not predetermination versus free will. But it's a combination of them both. If faith plus works is that eternal life, that salvation. And it's predetermined, predetermination plus free will that gives us the eternal life. We must have both. It's not one or the other. And so going back to Ephesians verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, to summarize that, to help us understand predetermination, God shows us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. He made a predetermination. He said, anybody... It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. It doesn't matter what your background. Anybody who desires to become my child needs to call upon me. And when he does, I will accept him. That's the predetermination. Those are the whosoever wills. Then we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ that we should be holy, blameless before him in love. That's not a in the sky, by and by kind of a thing. That is one of those things that we, there's a very practical aspect to sanctification. We live a lifestyle that's honoring to him here on this planet. So being pre, uh, predestined, he has predestined, uh, predestinated us to the adoption of, as being dear children to himself. These are the whoever dids. In other words, they heard the promise and they acted on it. According to his good pleasure, it's his good will that we should become his children to the praise and the glory of his grace. And so God created mankind to be his children, to be like him in his image, to share his glory, to be agents of grace. You know, there's 8.74 million species on the earth according to the Discovery Channel. 8.74 million species. And who knows how many species are in heaven? But we are the only one to be called the children of God. We're the only ones to receive the joint inheritance with Christ. Think about that. What a privilege that is for us. And yet so many people stop in their faith by saying, I believe in Christ, but never take that next step into actually trusting him to guide their lives. And I'm asking you today that with this information, that you allow him to walk with you to change your life, to transform your life, to take that next step, to dive in and go as deep as you can into that pure goodness. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There is no excuse. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. We have a tendency as human beings to say, I know how broken I am. I look over my shoulder and I look at the shipwreck of my life. God isn't going to be able to fix that. There are areas in my life that I'm not going to let go. There's damage in my life that I can't let go. There's hurt in my life that can't get healed. But that isn't true. Look at what it says. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. What's left out of that? Your past, your hurt, the jealousies that you carry with you, none of that is outside of that. All of that is within the power of God to reconcile and to bring, to, uh, to make straight, if you will, the things of your life. And how would we do that? Through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. You see, my theory has a biblical basis. 
if we look at this passage of Scripture, if we fully understand the glory of God, there is no reason in, our, in the world why we wouldn't want to dive in all the way and go as deep as we possibly can to be as good as we possibly can be to walk with Christ. There's no reason not to. There's nothing to be afraid of. Because through that knowledge, He has called us by glory and virtue. And remember, glory is a noun. It's a person, place, or thing. So He's called us to His glory. He wants to share that glory with us that we might be virtuous people. We might, it might be more than just a checklist of moral things. It's actually a walk that goes deep into our character with deep integrity. Verse 4, the same chapter. By which, we have been, that by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of His divine nature. And again, this is not by and by stuff, is it? This is not something we have to wait to get to heaven to see or to have part of us. He's willing to share His divine nature with us now. He has given us many precious promises that if we simply trust Him in those promises, we will partake in that divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. You see, you can't live in your sin. It's contrary to the will of God. He's not going to hold a hammer over your head and say, Oh man, I got you, boom. Oh man, I got you, boom. He's not saying that at all. Do you recognize that it says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him? God is a rewarder. That is His position. And as a rewarder, He wants to give things to you that are good. He simply wants to remove those things that are an obstacle to that. What a great blessing that is. Let that sink in for a second. If he's a rewarder and everything that he takes out of our life is an obstacle, then why wouldn't we want to let it go? He has given us to these things that we can escape the corruption that is in this world through lust. So to summarize this passage, God called us by glory and virtue. Grace and peace as a result of that are multiplied to us. He gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has given to us great and precious promises. Why? So we can participate in his divine nature now. Not some time in the future. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 21. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. What does that mean? Verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There is a time frame when the children of God are going to be revealed in this earth. People are going to see us for who we really are. And who we really are are kings and priests before God. And when that happens, in that day, and this is in the future, but when that day happens, all of creation is going to rejoice with us. I don't know about you, but I've taken strolls in the desert, and I sometimes look at the poor uh, bushes that are just so defeated, and they look like they're dying, and the dead rabbit on the side, and the, and the hillside that is just so dry and desolate, and every drop of water sinks in, and there's just like, it's just like creation is just like moaning and just waiting to be alive again. That's precisely what this is talking about. When will that happen? At the revealing of the children of God. When we are revealed for who we are as children of God, sharing in His glory. The whole of creation will be healed again. There won't be any more curse. And he says he subjected it in hope. In hope that even creation itself is waiting for that day. Verses 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, but we also, who have had the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. How many times have you said to yourself or said to somebody else, I just wish Jesus would come back today. Wouldn't it be nice to get up in the morning and not have the pain, to have, not have the IRS chasing you for every little penny and scrap that you've got? To not have to go to work and to labor and to come home and to try to sleep and only to get up at 5.30 in the morning to do it all over again day after day after day and just have Jesus Christ come and show you His glory. Wouldn't it be wonderful? And how many times have we said that to ourselves or to somebody else? That's what this verse is talking about. 
the very fact that we have the first fruits, we have the Spirit of God, we see that hope, and we see it as through a, gl a glass darkly. That phrase means a, a dark reflection. We can barely see what's going on, but we can kind of get glimpses of what heaven's going to be like and what that glory of God's going to be like, and we yearn for it like we can't wait to get there. It just says, oh, I wish this life was over so I could just see that glory face to face. That's what this verse is saying. We have the first fruits. We have the down payment of the Spirit of God living in us if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. And even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting that adoption because that is our hope. So creation waits for the revealing of the children of God. Creation groans like with birth pangs for that uh, in expectation, waiting for that day. It is subjected to futility and waits in hopeful expectation of its own deliverance. And then we groan within ourselves, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Verses 29 and 30, that same chapter. For whom he foreknew, there's that predestination thing again. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he has predestined, he has also called. And who he's called, he's also justified. And who he's justified, he is also glorified. Look at the transition here. God, who knew you before the foundation of the world, gave you that option. Here's a promise. If you accept it, then you're going to become my child. And when you become my child, I'm going to share my glory with you. And so he, who he predestined, he also called. He says you have a purpose. And whoever he called, he also justified. He gave you the righteousness of Christ. And whoever he justified, he will also glorify. He has already glorified you now, even though we may not see it right here. But in his eyes, we're already glorified. And yet he will glorify us all the more when we see him. So predestined is uh, whoever wills. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord. Those whoever wills have a promise. They simply need to take the faith step and appropriate it. And the, he's also predestinated those whoever dids. In other words, those whoever did, those who did call up, upon the Lord, will be saved. They will be conformed into the image of his son. They are called and commissioned with a purpose. They are justified, clothed with uh, Christ's righteousness, and they are glorified, given the honors of God's children. Can you see yourself like that? I have a really hard time envisioning myself like that. But take a little mental trip with me. Imagine yourself standing in heaven, robed in bright white light gown standing there with a crown or crowns upon your head as you are presented before the angels and all creation as the son or the daughter of the living God. That God the Father turns to you and in his rapture, in his glory, in his shiningness, turns to you and envelops you in a giant hug and says, welcome home my child. That's what this is talking about, man. That we're called, we're commissioned, we're told to be little lights here. That we're to go and tell other people so that they can become children of God as well. How hard is that? Think about eternity. You can't see that end, you can't see that end. And you've only got an 80 year lifespan and all of that eternity if you're average out normal person, right? With 80 years on that span, how big is it? It's like, you can't even see it. It's a piece of dust. 80 years is nothing. Why can't we dedicate our lives to see other people saved? Why can't we do that? It's because we cling to our own sin. We like to have our own sin. We like to justify ourselves in that own sin. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't talk to anybody about Christ. They might think I'm weird. Let them think you're weird, man. Who cares? 80 years from now, who's going to care? 100 years, 2,000 years. When you're standing before God in your own righteous glory as God has given that to you? Can you imagine looking over the groups of people that you have led to the Lord and they just give you honor and praise and thanks for what you've done for them? Isn't that worth it? And I'm not trying to be selfish here. I want to give all that glory to God because anything that glorifies us that he has given to us, we're simply going to turn and glorify him with that. Because it's him. It's all him. It's not us. We don't save anybody. But we have to make the effort, don't we? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 uh, through 8. Notice what this says. But one testified in a certain place, saying, 
What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? Somebody's questioning God here. What does man matter, in other words? Why does it even, why do you even care about them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You have set them over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under their feet. For in that he has put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not under him. But now we do not see all things put under him. I tend to be a fairly big thinker. I'm an architect by profession and I can dream big. But I never could figure out how is a God going to take all of the saints, all the saints from history past, all the saints from history future, if you will, and put them all into a place like heaven and say, you're all kings and priests before me. Now I've got a place for you to rule. And so what's he going to do? Take the earth, subdivide it into little counties or cities or something, and each one of us gets a little city to rule over? I couldn't quite figure all that out. You know, that's, that's really small thinking on my part. Because God's infinite. Imagine him with an infinite kingdom. Imagine him giving us an, an infinite rulership, if you will. This is an amazing thing to think about. Because it says right here, and of course I'm speculating, I don't know. But it says right here, but now we do not see all the things put under him. We know what was promised to Adam, but that was a preparation ground. That was not the actual thing. And so here it says that he's put, that he has left nothing that is not put under him. He wants to share his glory with us. So God's thoughts are on mankind. The question asks, what is man that you are mindful of him? Why do you even think about him? You're God. He's nothing. He's a grub. He's nothing. But God thinks on mankind. And God cares for you. What is the son of man that you care for him is the second question. In other words, he is willing to humble himself to think and to care about you. We're made a little lower than the angels in terms of power and prestige, but one day we're going to be greater than they, crowned with glory and honor and set over God's creation. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, but we see Jesus now, notice this, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels. Same phraseology. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. For it is fitting, and this blows my mind, it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to take or to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Why did Jesus have to suffer on the cross? Why, with all of God's power, didn't he just roll everything up and say, well, that was a nice try. Throw it over his shoulder and do it all again. He could have, but he didn't. Because he loves us. Can you imagine? I mean, think about this. When he was creating everything, he did everything in six days, including the creation of man. And yet, in those first five days, he created everything simply by speaking it into existence. And yet, he got down into the dirt and he created a man with his own hands and breathed life into him. He had a concept of who he wanted as a child, as his own children. And he formed that. And he blew that spirit of God into that person. And that person became a living being. And through that, he was looking down through the years, knowing that he himself, his son, Jesus Christ, co-eternal with the Father. In other words, he and the Father had never been apart from one another. Co-eternal with the Spirit of God, never been apart from one another. Jesus Christ had to stand up from his throne and literally take his divinity and set it aside to become a human being, to become part of that dust on this earth to become part of the corruption that is here. And it says that he, would, that he is to suffer death, to taste death for us. Why is that fitting? Why is that proper? He, had, he is omniscient. He had all knowledge. He didn't have to go through it to figure it out. Why is it fitting? It's because he loves us. It's fitting because he wants us to be his children. Because God's wrath is upon those who commit treason, who, who rebel against him 
And yet Jesus Christ said, I'll lead them. I'll do what it takes. And so he set his divinity aside. He became mere flesh. He tasted death for everyone so that he may bring many sons to glory. Many children to glory. And to be their captain of their salvation, perfected through those sufferings. Verse 11 through 13, For both he who sanctifies, that's Jesus Christ, and those who are being sanctified, that's anybody who puts their trust in him as Savior, they are all one. You see, now God is reunited with his creation the way that it was originally. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare their name, uh, uh, your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given to me. He won't lose a single one of us. When we literally, actually, honestly, with all of our heart and soul, put our faith in Jesus Christ, he, and he indwells us with his spirit, he says, you can't get lost. That's it. I've got you. You are secure in your salvation. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Inasmuch as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So how did the devil get this power of death? There's a lot of speculation by scholars. They think, seem to think that he stole some keys of death and hell and he seemed to do this other things. I think it's a whole lot more simple than that. He rebelled against God and he got death as part of the deal. And by that, before he actually experiences that eternal damnation, he's going to take every single person that he can with him. So he has the power of lying. He's called the father of lies. And so he deceives people, makes them think that death is the end when in reality death is the beginning. You see, if you're a Christian, there's no fear in death. You can look, now maybe you're afraid of the process. I don't look forward to the process. I don't know what process God's going to use to take me home. I hope I'm sleeping and I just kind of, poof, show up in heaven. But I tell you what, if I'm driving home and I'm going like 80 miles an hour in a 75 mile an hour zone, which I shouldn't be, but if I do and I go careening off the side and I kill myself, then I'm not afraid of death itself. In my experience, by the grace of God, I have been through, I have been to the doorstep of death seven times in my life. And it's okay. It's okay. You can be that sound mind when everybody else is in chaos. It's a beautiful thing to have the Spirit of God indwelling you. But inasmuch as the children partook in the flesh and blood, so he himself took on flesh and blood, that he might destroy the power of death. And so the devil, I don't think, stole anything, frankly. I think it was, he was condemned. And by that, he wanted to deceive as many and take as many as he could with him. Verse 16, same chapter. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels. Think this out. Think about what he just said. There are angels that rebelled against him, but Jesus didn't die for them. Jesus didn't die for them. He died for you. But he does give aid to the seed of Abraham, okay? A euphemism for human beings. The seed of Abraham are those who are chosen by God. Those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Verse 17, Therefore in all things he had made, uh, <clears throat> he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make propitiation, to, to take that, um, to take that, uh, punishment for us, if you will, for the sins of his people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So here again, not only has he given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, we are without excuse. There is no addiction. There is no sin that has captivated us. There is no pain in our past. There is no thing that can happen in our future. There is nothing that gives us an excuse not to walk worthy of his calling. But here, even when we are tempted, Jesus was tempted in every way like we are, except without sin. And so he's, through his temptation, he has now shown us the path. And he's also able at this point that when we are tempted, all we got to do is call out to him and say, Lord, I'm tempted. I don't want to take that step. And he's able to aid us. He's able to aid us in our temptation so that we are without excuse. 
So in this, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. He was crowned with glory and honor. He brings many children to glory, and he and his children are one through sanctification. Jesus became flesh to destroy the works of the devil, to set free those who were in bondage of the fear of death. And Jesus suffered that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. You see, Peter says, and I'll read this passage in a moment, but Peter says that we are a royal priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. So if we are kings and priests, therefore we have a high priest who is Jesus Christ. That he might be merciful and faithful in fulfilling that office as high priest and able to aid those who are tempted. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Grace, uh, by grace are you saved. And raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Catch that. Where is Christ seated right now? At the right hand of God. He's in his throne. And where are we positionally through salvation? We're sitting there right along with him. We're sharing that authority with him, if you will. We are raised, he has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I'll be wrapping it up with these. But you are a chosen generation. I didn't change the word there. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see the sharing of God's glory there? We're called out of the darkness to share in his glorious light. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Revelation 22, verses 3 through 5. And there shall be no more curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. This is talking about the future restored uh, Jerusalem is talking about the future place in heaven. It's talking about the dwelling place of God here. Verse 4, they shall see his face and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp and no light of the sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Remember I told you how powerful God's glory was? Remember how I said that no man can stand before God's face and live? Remember how I said that his glory is such perfect pureness that nothing but purity can stand before him? Look at what this verse says. Verse 4, they shall see his face. Have you ever wondered about what God looks like? There's your chance. One day we're going to see God face to face and we are going to be justified before him. We're going to be able to stand in his presence. We're going to be pure as he is pure. And what's so cool about it is he says that we will share in reigning with him forever and ever. I don't know about you, but that's a long time. And that fills me with great hope. And that is the glory of God, isn't it? God saved us to share his glory. God created us to share his glory. And so God is glorified in his creation. He made us in his image. A little lower than the angels in terms of, of uh, strength right now and prestige. And yet he has predestinated us to be adopted as children. To be crowned with honor and glory. To be seated with Christ in the heavenlies. To be priests and kings before him. And to reign with Christ for all eternity. This is the glory of God. To create mankind in his image. To save us from our own corruption. To love us as a husband loves his bride. To crown us with honor and glory. And to set us on thrones that we may reign with him for all eternity. I'll tell you what. If you could get to know your heavenly father in those terms. There is absolutely nothing that you wouldn't be willing to do for him now. And so that's the challenge that we have. Same questions as last week. How have you limited God in your own mind and thoughts? What barriers are there before you that keep you from serving God the way you know you need to be? 
What barriers are there? What aren't you willing to give up? And the real question is, how does these new insights change that? I hope this has been an encouraging message to you. But it should also be a thought-provoking message. So that when we look at Christ, and we look at the glory of God, that we recognize that we're entitled to that. Not because we deserve anything. We don't deserve anything but God's wrath. And yet through God's grace, he said he's predestinated us to that glory. Let's give him glory by living our lives out completely, wholeheartedly, and faithfully each day. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just give you the praise and the thanks for all of the love that you've given to us and that your glory is so magnificent that you have created us with a passion and with a purpose, that you've given us a cause to live for, that you have given us the power over uh, the fear of death, and that you have given us the right hand of God, the power of God, with everything through your knowledge that, that is necessary for life and godliness. Father God, forgive us for our sins. And I pray, dear God, if there's even one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray, dear God, they don't leave this room without that saving knowledge. Father God, convict our hearts today. If there is sin we need to confess before you, I pray that it would be heartfelt and taken care of today, right now. And I pray, Father, if there's one who needs you, I pray that you would just move upon their heart. Woo them to you, dear God, that they may be among those many children. Glorify yourself through it all, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.